Welcome to the Sports Bar Life. I'm your host, Sri Bisuasam. Thank you for tuning in. The Sports Bar Life is home to your major event sporting coverage. Today is our third show after kicking off last month. Our first two shows were boxing related, which gave both a pre-fight and post-fight look at the money fight, Floyd Mayweather versus Conor McGregor. Today, we now turn our attention to football The UEFA Champions League group stage has arrived and we've got a monster preview show for you. The Sports Bar Life is from Melbourne, Australia. However, today we are providing a European look at the most prestigious tournament in club football. And on today's show, we'll be speaking to John Davidson. John is an Australian football journalist based in England who'll provide his take on the UEFA Champions League with a focus on the five English sides competing in the tournament. In addition, he'll provide his thoughts on the Socceroos' performance in their Asian Group B World Cup qualifying campaign. We'll then head to Germany and speak to Sky Sports television commentator Florian Schmidt-Sommerfeld, who'll discuss the Champions League from a Bundesliga perspective. Then, as a special bonus, we'll chat to Willy Orban, captain of RB Leipzig, who'll take part in the UEFA Champions League for the first time this season. And to finish, since we are all about that life, that sports bar life, we'll talk to Grant Vink of the Imperial Hotel in Melbourne to discuss their live showing of the Champions League this week. And yes, the Imperial does show live Champions League football at 5am in the morning midweek. So it's a must listen for anyone who is interested in watching Champions League football in public with like-minded supporters. Before we start, to keep up to date with the Sports Bar Life, make sure you subscribe to the show on the platform you are listening to this program. You can also keep up to date by following us on Twitter with our Twitter handle at Sports Bar Life or you can follow me at Sri underscore Visuasam. Let's get to it. And first today, we chat to John Davidson. Thanks for joining us, John. Before we get into our deep football discussion, it would be great for our listeners to learn a bit more about yourself and and what your journalistic involvement with football is. Yeah, um, I've been a journalist for, uh, that's a good question, um, over sort of 11 to 12 years, I think now, um, and sort of been covering, I've always been a, a football fan and a Player at amateur level, but covering football um, for about uh, seven years, um, writing for a number of different publications, but primarily at the moment for for Four Four Two Australia and SBS, the World Game website, um, and uh, yeah, that, those are probably the two main ones that that um, that I contribute most regularly to. Oh, excellent! And uh, at present, you're situated in England. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm based in the UK. So in terms of your um, exposure to football, I guess being in the UK will give you a good uh, feel for um, football uh, in, in, in probably the most broadest sense. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a dominant uh, sport in, here in England. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's number one by a far margin. So it's, um, it's a good market to be in, in terms of seeing the passion of, of fans and also the way the media covers the game and just how it sort of trickles down all across uh, society in the UK. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah, it's interesting stuff. So, um, so yeah, it's certainly great to have you on and uh, to, to learn uh, and, and hear from your perspective on things. And and I guess before we get into our Champions League discussion, uh, there has been a lot going on in Australian football in the past week and uh, the Socceroos had their final two World Cup qualifying games within their um, Asian um qualifying group uh so looking at their two games with japan and thailand most recently uh what can you what can we make of um their progress within the asian world cup group b qualifying round yeah i mean obviously it was a very disappointing result against japan 
Um, and then, and then against Thailand, it was a, you know, a really dominant performance, but wasn't really, the luck didn't really seem to go the Socceroos way. So looking at the, the qualifying as a whole, um, I think there has been a, a bit of hysteria about, about, um, the last two games. Obviously, they're heading out to face Syria in the two-legged playoff, and then hopefully, um, the fourth place team in CONCACAF for the, for the final spot of the World Cup. Um, it's the first time we haven't we haven't qualified directly since uh, 2006, and obviously qualification of the World Cup means a lot to Australian football, not only in terms of money, but just in in, in um, uh, the, the sort of whole coverage and, and brand of the game that, that we get across. Um, but yeah, now there's been I guess a bit of a hysterical reaction because um, you're looking at the, the last qualifying group. The soccer has only lost one game, uh, and I think Saudi Arabia lost three, and Japan lost two, so. It's really a couple of draws that have, have really um, cost the Socceroos and, and goal difference, really. I don't think the performances have been that bad. But then in saying that, um, Ange Postecoglou has got a very uh, sort of one, one-way one plan A sort of uh, approach, and it's his way of the highway. There hasn't been a lot of flexibility or, or pragmatism, so I guess that has worried and concerned a lot of people in, in football. Yeah, it, it, is, it is interesting, um, the... The way Ange Postacoglu, the coach, has um, been about the the way the Socceroos game style is. I guess with uh, one of the main points that have been discussed is their change in the defensive structure. Uh, do you feel that Ange has had um, has had the right game plan in terms of managing? the Socceroos' development over these 10 qualifying games? Yeah, he, he has um, obviously switching that three-man back line in the right game was, a, I think, quite a, a key moment. I mean, he, he obviously felt it was the way forward and the best way for, for the Socceroos to win games. But I think a lot of people and, and, and myself tend to agree that there doesn't seem to be uh, a plan B with the national team at the moment. Um, it's a very sort of rigid formation that he has and, um, I guess it's uh, a bit obvious to the opposition. They they know exactly what we're going to do. So to counter that, as as we saw in with Japan in in uh, Saitama, um, is 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 quite easy uh, at times. And you know, obviously with, with with Thailand, we we saw that as well. You know, they scored a goal on the break, and you know sometimes it can the the positioning and the the way the formation is can leave some massive holes for opposition to exploit. So I think. Some people would like to see, you know, a, a bit more of a pragmatic approach at times, depending on the on the opponents. We, we saw that loss, um, I think it was 4-0 to Brazil uh, before the Confederations Cup as well. Um, but I guess that, that is Ange Postecoglou, and I see he's very determined, he's very focused on what he wants to do. Um, he doesn't really care about criticism that much or outside opinion. Um, it's sort of his his way or the highway, and... He'll see it through to the end, um, regardless of what that is. And I know some people have been, you know, calling for his head and to, for, to be, for for him to be um, removed from the position of head coach. But personally, I think I think he should see it out. Um, obviously, fingers crossed we do qualify. But um, you know, I think he should be able to to get them over the line. And I think that you know the, the soccer is still a very good, a good chance of be playing in Russia next year. Mm, yeah, well, I guess with his uh, approach where he's pretty steadfast within uh, his the way he sees things, uh, you would think that if they do manage to get through to Russia and uh, overcome these hurdles, uh, over the, assuming they can get past Syria first, um, in order to get to Russia, that it might benefit them by having this uh, mentality yeah that's that's a, that's a very good point I think um, you know they're going to be very high pressure games um, they're going to be tough games even you know I think Syria are 80th ranked 80th in the world so you know, on, on paper the Socceroos will be you know big favourites but they will be tough games these two legged playoffs are always tricky no matter who you play and we've seen that over the years with the Socceroos with Uruguay and Iran and Argentina and going back to Israel and and even before that, so they're always tough, and uh, that having, I guess, four more games, hopefully, um, that will that will sort of, I guess, create a bit more steel within the squad and um, a bit more purpose. It will get them together more often, and hopefully, um, you know, keep building that bond between the players. Um, so yeah, that that is a, a good point. It, it certainly could make them battle hardened on the way to to 
the world, the world cup, but of course they have to, to do the business now. Um, and I think most people would settle for, you know, one nil wins or, or arguably terrible performances as long as the results go, uh, Australia's way. Yeah. Well, I, I think, uh, Oh, it's going to be interesting to see how they, they shape up next month with Syria. Do you feel that the, the approach that the Socceroos will take will be similar to what we've seen recently? Yeah, I think it will. I can't really uh, see Ange Postecoglou making too many changes. I think he'll, he'll stick with the same tactics and, and largely the same players. There's not a huge player pool to, cho- to choose from in terms of um, people playing regularly in in in, you know, in the top leagues in Europe. Um, there might be some slight tinkering, but I, he's he seems pretty um, assured of what he wants, and uh, I, I think it'll be the same approach. Um, obviously, Syria, you know, different opponent to, to Thailand and to Japan, but I think he'll be looking to to play, you know, in a positive way in attacking motion and try and dominate possession as as they have pretty much in nearly every game, you would say, under his reign of, of four years. Yeah, just going into that Thailand game for a moment, the Socceroos certainly had dozens of chances and, and dominated ball control for most of the game. Is is there a, a an issue with the, the offensive side to the game for the Socceroos if they're not able to convert? Uh, were they only able to convert two chances when they had... Oh, about 45? Yeah, I think it was 45 shots on goal. I think um, scoring goals for the Socceroos has been a problem for, for quite some time. Um, we've, we've relied on Tim Cahill for, for years and years, and, and you know more often than not, he has produced. That's why he's our, our record goal scorer. But you know, he's 37 now, and I think, you know, to be honest, his, his powers are waning, and um, you know, there's, there's a good chance that he won't actually make the World Cup squad, although... Ange seems to have a lot of faith still in him, but yeah, we we need um, sort of the new breed of forwards to come up. I think um, Tommy Urich coming into um, particularly the Confederations Cup and in the games a bit earlier this year was sort of growing into that mould, but he seemed to be um, carrying an injury in the Japan game, and and then again in Thailand he probably wasn't at his at his best. And we we've we've seen you know for the last couple of years we, we've had problems scoring goals repeatedly, so. We definitely need someone to step forward and try and uh, um, sort of lead the attack, and, and whether that's a Jamie or McLaren or, or someone else um, of that ilk, uh, it, it's really hard to say because there aren't a lot of uh, Australian strikers out there scoring regular goals, whether it be in the A League or overseas. A lot of the, the top strikers in the A League are actually foreign, you know, whether they be Bess Harisha or Andy Keogh. Um, or, or one of those guys. So it's definitely a, an area of concern, um, you know, in that sort of centre forward area for, for Australia. And I guess uh, looking at, uh, let's just say the Socceroos were able to get to Russia, uh, how effective do you think their offensive game at the moment would um, compare with the likes of the other nations who would see at the World Cup? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really hard to. to to comment on that because um, we've seen a real sort of full gamut of performances from the Socceroos. I think you know they were very poor against Brazil uh, this year and and also very poor against Germany. You know, two of the best teams in the world. Um, and you know, against Cameroon, it, w- it was a bit of a patchy performance. That was a draw, but then they then came up against Chile in in, uh, in Moscow, and I was at that game. And to be honest, I was. Um, uh, Quite uh, worried before the game, I, I thought a, uh, another loss was on the cards. Obviously, Chile being the number four in the world and, and you know pre- uh, possessing some um, some fantastic players, but Australia really took the game to them and um, you know dominated large parts of it. And it finished one-one, but uh, the Soccers were very very unlucky not to win that game. So I think they've shown uh, over time that they can they can match it with the best in the world on their day. It's just that consistent consistency of performance that we're not seeing. Um, so, it really, I mean, when you get to the World Cup, it does come down to the draw, um, and also, you know, a bit of luck here and there. Um, you know, with a bit of luck, um, Australia would have beaten the Netherlands in, in Brazil um, or, or drawn with them. And obviously, you know, they they had a, the pool of death in the last World Cup with Chile, the Netherlands, and and Spain, uh, the, the the previous World Cup holders. So. Uh, 
it does come down to a lot to the draw, but um, I think the first is yeah, they've just got to get to that tournament, and then they can worry about how they uh, compete in it. But we have seen, I guess, over the last couple of years, you know, the emergence of Aaron Moy and the emergence of Tom Rogic, and, and a goalkeeper Matt Ryan is now in the Premier League. So there are some 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 players coming through um, that I think we can have a lot of hope around as well. Yeah, well, well we certainly um, hope that they can um, really uh, shine come um, the next few games, or hopefully the next four games to qualify and, and into the World Cup itself. Uh, if you looked at the Asian uh, qualifiers to date, and let's include Australia and Syria in this uh, question, who would you say would, at, at present, from what you've seen, who would you say is the best placed nation to succeed in the World Cup next year? Oh, I think probably without a doubt it's it's Iran. Uh, they were the, the first team to qualify from Asia. They they really dominated their group. Um, I think they're they're a, a very dangerous team. They they did quite well at the last World Cup. Um, if I remember correctly, they really matched with Argentina for for large periods. Who, who made the final and um, were a little bit unlucky not to get something out of that game. So. They're, um, I think they're a really talented team. Um, they've got some really, really good players, uh, both domestically and, and in Europe. Um, they've got a, a very wily coach in, in Carlos Quiroz, who, who used to uh, be at Real Madrid and was an assistant at Manchester United to, to Alex Ferguson at, at one point. Um, yeah, I also saw them at the Asian Cup, and I thought they were you know, a, a really strong team. So I think they're probably the, the top team in Asia. Uh, at the moment, and I think that's reflected in the, the FIFA rankings. Uh, and then you will probably say Japan, um, uh, uh, number two, um, and you know Australia probably not far behind that. Um, I think South Korea are going through a bit of a transitional phase, um, but Japan definitely have you know some some really world class players um, and the, sort of the ability. But again, it is you know performing on that big stage. Um, but Aram Aram would definitely be my choice um, for I guess um, perhaps the, the the best Asian team to to make some noise at the World Cup. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. It, it, it's been pretty impressive to see uh, how they've progressed within the within their group. Uh, and and yeah, we'll we'll see how how they all um, fare come Russia. So. Let's uh, move to European football now, and so we're we're a few days out from the first matches that will take place in the group stage of the UEFA Champions League. So what is the buzz in England and in Europe as a whole heading into the first round of our group stage matches? Well, I think um, because of the international break at the moment, it's been there hasn't been a lot of buzz. Um, obviously the the season's sort of five games in now, and um, a lot of the focus has been on the domestic season and obviously the last two games of the international break. But I think on Monday, it's really going to um, it's really going to ramp up. I mean, it's a it's a really exciting Champions League draw as we've seen, and particularly a really tough draw for some of the English clubs. So um, yeah, it, it sort of bodes well. I think English clubs have really struggled. Uh, in recent seasons in the Champions League, so it's not going to be easy for them to to compete again this season. Yeah, well, um, it, it's going to be quite uh, interesting this time around. I guess having Man U uh, back in the fold uh, might give the uh, competition more attention than it might normally get in, in England. Uh, in terms of the... UEFA Champions League, given the amount of football with all the domestic leagues uh, across Europe that take place, where does the UEFA Champions League sit within the sphere of club football? Yeah, I think I think it's very highly. Um, I think it, apart from the Premier League itself, it, it, it would be number one. So you know, you'd probably put it slightly at number two. I think it's definitely... Uh, although the, the FA Cup's still got a lot of romanticism around it, it, it's definitely above the FA Cup and the other cups, the League Club, the League Cup and the, um, the EFL, EFL Cup, which they keep renaming them pretty much every season. But no, I think, I think the Champions League still has a lot of, um, uh, a lot of prestige. Uh, it's really where, where all the big clubs want to be. And, um, and obviously, you know, the, the fini- financial rewards are, a massive as well, but you know the English teams haven't really fared that well in the last five years. It's been, I think, it was Chelsea was the last team in the final in, in 2012, 
Um, and there's only there's hardly been any English teams in the quarter final, reaching the quarter final stage in the last couple of years as well. So it, it hasn't been easy uh, for for English clubs at all. Yeah, with um, the Champions League being a midweek um, schedule, how does that um, figure with um, the attention from the public? Is is that an issue in terms of? Um, Play, clubs managing players, or is that an issue with TV ratings? No, it doesn't doesn't really seem to be an issue. I think it's, it's just ingrained in the culture in England. Um, you know, midweek matches are, are very co- common, and I, I think players are generally used to playing you know twice a week, three times a week. Um, I think a lot of players prefer to be playing rather than training more or less time out in the training paddock. So it, it's, it really is part of the culture, and I, I think it's. Um, it's just uh, something that, that that are used to, and obviously it's, it isn't the same in Australia. But uh, in 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 England, and I, I would dare say throughout Europe, it's um, just part of the culture in, in having midweek games pretty much every week. Mm, yeah, yeah, that that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, it's, I guess for for the fans, more football, um, the better. Uh, you, you'd think. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, so let's look at the groups now. Uh, as far as the eight groups that um, that have been drawn out um, over the past couple of weeks, about two weeks ago, which of the groups are, are you particularly looking for most forward to follow? Ah, that's a good. That's a really good question. Uh, you put me on the spot there. I think um, I think uh, Group E with with Sevilla, uh, Maribor, Spartak Moscow, and Liverpool is is uh, a, a quite a juicy one. I mean, I think um, Liverpool would have been wondering um, what they what they'd done wrong to draw that group because it's it's a really difficult group. I mean, um, any well, I think Maribor will probably finish bottom. They'll they'll find it the toughest. But Sevilla are a very very good team, and Spartak Moscow you can't really write them off either. So that's that's a really strong one. And I think the other one that. Um, Really stands out is uh, well the the two others that stand out Group G with Besiktas, uh, Leipzig, Monaco and Porto, and Group H with uh, with Spurs, Real Madrid, Apoel and, and Borussia Dortmund. Um, you know, Real versus Dortmund, and um, that's 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 a huge a huge game, and, and obviously Tottenham. Are, much like Liverpool, will be wondering why they got such a difficult draw. Mm, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I was quite fascinated by um, the, the way um, that that group was drawn with Tottenham. Yeah, it's going to be quite um, quite a challenge to see them progress uh, with um, the the Premier League side. So, being five teams uh, this time around, with um, Man U coming through by winning the Europa League. Uh, how do you view the the chances of the English sides this time around? Yeah, I, th- I think they're going to find it very very tough this season. I think apart from from Manchester United, who who got quite a fortunate draw, um, just being alongside um, Baal, Benfica, and CSK Moscow, um, while there won't be a, a walkover in anyone's terms, uh, they've you know they've missed one of the big teams from from Italy or Germany or Spain, and um, that's quite a you know quite a fortunate. Group that they've got in, um, but I think for for the others it's it's going to be very very tough. And that's um, not mentioning earlier Group C with with Chelsea, with Atletico Madrid, and and Roma. Uh, you know they'll they'll be um, they'll have to be at their best to to make sure they get through that group as well because that's a that's a very very tough group. So uh, I think um, for 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 most of the English teams apart from Manchester United, it's it's going to be back to the wall stuff just to get out of their group. Um, they're really going to have to be uh, on their game. Mm, yeah, well, it we'll certainly uh, be interesting to see how uh, each of the five English sides uh, uh, go about their six um, matches within the group stage. With the with what we're going to see uh, over the the coming months, have you from what you've seen and in, in, in terms of the different European leagues and in terms of what we've seen in the season to date uh, across those respective leagues, who are you expect to feature um, come the business end of the Champions League uh, later on in the season? Yeah, I think you, you can't really go past you know the, the big guns and, and being Real Madrid and Barcelona, uh, Bayern, and uh, I think Manchester United who, who started really well in the Premier League. I think they'll carry that form onto um, the Champions League and uh, Jose Mourinho is a bit of a, a Champions League expert, so 
I think they'll do really well. I think Manchester City will, will find it tough uh, in their group. I think uh, they should go through, but, you know, with Napoli and Feyenoord and Shakhtar Donetsk, um, there's some tricky ties there, particularly, you know, going to the Ukraine is, is not easy, and, and Napoli are, are, are quite a good team. So um, I, th- I think uh, it's going to be the, the big guns. Uh, but in saying that, you know, someone like Liverpool... Um, They've, they've got a great history with the tournament and, you know, on their day they can, they can match anyone. So, uh, you can't re- sort of either, can't either rule out, uh, one of those teams, um, having a great run through. Uh, but I think, uh, particularly for, from the English point of view, that they'd, they'd love some English teams to get through to, to the final stages because it, it's been such a, a lean couple of years in, in the Champions League for, for the English teams. Mm, yeah, yeah. It, it'll be, yeah, it'd be great for English football if they can see um, some of their sides come the quarterfinals, semifinals, etc. Uh, featuring. So, in terms of uh, the other teams within the competition, the the beauty of the Champions League is you, you do have um, such a diverse range of sides. Given there's those pre-qualifying rounds, and you've got most of Europe um, being able to well, it's pretty much all of Europe that, uh, and then it filters through within those respective qualifiers to decide the final 32. Out of the other sides that um, have qualified that might be lesser known to um, uh, football fans in Australia, uh, are there any teams that um, uh, people should be uh, looking out for to, to see if they can spring up a surprise? Yeah, I think um, one one uh, club that I must admit I'd don't know much about it at all, but but just been running up recently is, uh, and I, I apologise if I get this pronunciation one bad, uh, wrong, is 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 Quarabag, which are um, an Azerbaijani club. Uh, so uh, there hasn't been too many football clubs from from that part of the world make it through to the Champions League. Um, they're they're going to be coming up against Chelsea, Atletico Madrid, and Roma. So. It's going to be a, a massive, massive task for them, but um, that's that's sort of the beauty of the competition that you get these sort of teams coming in. Um, I think Apple well have, have had some, some a fair bit of experience in the Champions League now after so doing so well um, the last couple of years. You know, coming from Cyprus, um, I guess massive on underdogs as well, but you know they've uh, they've managed to hold their own at times. So so that's been great to see. Uh, great to see. I think the, the Portuguese teams are generally do quite well. Uh, and the other one, I guess, that you should definitely keep an, out for, an eye out for is, is Maribor um, from Slovenia. Um, yeah, they've, they've participated in the group stages before um, and, you know, they're, they're going to be uh, up against it. But, you know, that's, that's the beauty of the European nights. Um, you know, really anything can happen at times. Mm, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's great um, to get your um, insight with, those different sides, yeah, it's quite fascinating to see uh, who comes through and, um, and and takes part in this uh, this this, this uh, prestigious tournament. Uh, so before we finish on on the Champions League, uh, I guess we've seen in recent times the dominance from the Spanish sides, in particular uh, Barcelona and Real Madrid. Um, and Athletic have also been uh, featured um, at the business end as well. Uh, do you think that it will be another Spanish team that um, that comes up trumps at the end? I'm I'm a terrible tipster, but I'd yeah. I'd, if if I had to put my money on someone, I'd, I'd definitely uh, pick one of the, the three Spanish teams. Um, they've just uh, you know had such a great run in, in recent years. Obviously, Real Madrid winning last year and, and in 2016 as well. Uh, and you know, Atletico being in the final, and, and Barcelona winning it before that, I, I definitely pick one of those three to to get to that stage. They just, um, you know, apart from the, the squads that they have, but they just have the pedigree and the experience uh, in this competition to go all the way. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's see, um, let's see how how um, how it does all unfold. And uh, yeah, it's certainly uh, going to be exciting stuff. Uh, and yeah, just before we go, John, uh, what 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 are your plans in terms of your uh, media involvement uh, coming up, um, whether it be Champions League, League related or or Premier League or, or or domestic Australian football? Yeah, um, just just basically um, getting ready for the start of the A League season. Um, we're doing a couple of stories on the FFA Cup, which obviously is coming up to quarter final 
time. Um, but yeah, um, doing some 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 previews for Four Foot Two magazine on on the, on the A League and um, looking at a doing a piece on um, some of the best signings from from each club. Um, and yeah, obviously. Um, Hopefully speaking to some of the Socceroos in the next couple of weeks about the, the games against Syria coming on in October. Um, and, and from time to time, I do a bit of freelance uh, work, oh, well, freelance work covering the, um, the clubs in the Championship and League One that are, that are near where I live. So looking at Sheffield United, Sheffield Wednesday, Barnsley, uh, Chesterfield, Rotherham, those, those ones. So uh, as a, always the case of football, it's really a, a sport that never ends um, when you're all around the world. Um, off season is so is so short, so always plenty to to keep us entertained. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like you, you've got a uh, yeah heaps of um, football to cover there, and um, I'm sure sure it must be fun. Uh, and for our um, our, our listeners, uh, what's the best way for um, them to um, keep uh, informed with uh, all, all your work um, in in the football world? Yeah, uh, probably Twitter is the is the best way. My Twitter handle is Johnny D Davidson. Um, but yeah, I usually you know tweet out any any stories that I have. But um, yeah, following following obviously follow me there and. Um, uh, 442, uh, which is also on Twitter and Facebook and SBS The World Game. Uh, those are probably the, the main, uh, the main outlets to, to catch my work. Fantastic. Well, uh, yeah, we certainly, uh, look forward to, um, not only the Champions League, uh, the A League and the Australian World Cup qualifying progress, but, um, we certainly also look forward to keeping in touch with, um, all your, um, content that you will be producing, um, in the coming months so uh, thank you once again John uh, it's been great to chat and uh, yeah we certainly uh, look forward to, um, to to all the upcoming football in store for us well thanks for having me on it was uh, great to speak great to hear from John it will be worth keeping an eye on those Champions League sides such as Quarabag and Murray Bort that he touched on and we certainly look forward to following the Socceroos continue their quest for a spot in the World Cup when they play Syria next month. Now to our next guest, we speak to Bundesliga and Champions League television commentator for Sky Sports, Florian Schmidt-Sommerfeld. Great to uh, have you on the show, Florian. We certainly uh, look forward to getting your perspective on all things German football and the Champions League. Uh, Before we start, can you please give our listeners a bit of a breakdown in terms of your involvement with uh, the media. Yeah, I started off uh, in the media uh, like um, six years ago. Uh, I was going to a radio station um, that's uh, completely driven by, by students um, in, their, in their time next to their studies. And that's where yeah, I learned the basics of journalism. And um, two years ago um, was a big step for me um, when uh, I started uh, commentating uh, NFL games uh, for Pro7 Sat 1 in, in Germany. So um, yeah, we showed uh, two NFL games per week, and uh, I was one of the hosts and uh, commentators of these games. And um, yeah, that's that's when I really had uh, kind of my my breakthrough. In, uh, in the commentator's world. And um, this summer, I, I switched um, from NFL to um, German Bundesliga, so uh, Fußball, how we call it here. I don't know if you say football or soccer. Um, yeah, it's one of those two. And uh, I'm also a, a handball commentator right now. And, um, yeah, the new station I switched to um, is uh, Sky. So that's the... Um, the exclusive broadcaster for um, live football and uh, live handball in Germany. Wow, that, that, that's really interesting. Uh, certainly uh, must keep you busy um, having that um, broad range of sporting commentary. So uh, looking at um, your involvement now, I guess Bundesliga is now in full swing and, uh, and we're about to see the Champions League start exactly uh, so how um how is uh, a, a typical week for, for florian schmidt sommerfeld a uh, typical week um i let it start with monday so um 
like uh, around uh, when I had lunch, I'd say, I'll finally start start to work on Mondays and uh, start my preparations for whatever game comes up. Um, right now, when, when Champions League and Europa League are going to start, um, yeah, my games um, are going to be on, on yeah Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, can happen any time. So um, whatever comes up there, um, I'm watching the last games of the two clubs. I'm going to be commentating um, a read about the players and stuff to be prepared. And um, yeah, that's basically what I, what I do the next days as well, since um, yeah, weekend's not far away. And normally Friday um, and uh, Saturday and Sundays, um, at least one of these days, I'm always um, commentating for Sky, sometimes even two days of the weekend. Yeah, well, that, that's pretty cool. I certainly, uh, it must um, keep you busy having the midweek games and the games at the end of the week. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, so I guess now um, we're heading into Champions League season and, uh, and we're certainly uh, excited here in Australia. And I wanted to get your thoughts on the, the Champions League as a whole. So in Germany at present... Uh, uh, what is the buzz like uh, ahead of uh, this year's Champions League? Yeah, I mean, um, as uh, always over the last years, uh, FC Bayern is uh, the big favorite, uh, the club everyone's looking to. They are, yeah, the the record champion. They are at the moment a five-time reigning Bundesliga champion, um, and they were also the most um, successful club in the Champions League over the last years. Uh, so everyone's looking at FC Bayern. But they have some, um, yeah, they lost two big players in, in Xabi Alonso and Philipp Lahm. Um, yeah, two really great European players, some of the best that played uh, in the last couple of years. And so um, they time's starting to change a little bit in Munich. Um, and um, everyone's really curious how Carlo Ancelotti, the trainer, um, is going gonna, is gonna to manage... Um, to cope with those uh, two big players he lost and um, if he's going to be successful in uh, bringing the the young guys in there because uh, he didn't manage to do that as well as uh, Pep Guardiola did before, um, who trained the Bayern for, for three years before Ancelotti. And um, yeah, that's what everyone's really curious about. Um, as well as what um, Leipzig going to do for their first time in the Champions League, I mean, they rocked the Bundesliga last year. Uh, they came up from the second league and um, had a hell of a season, finished second place. Um, so that was really, really strong. And um, they managed to keep their core together. Naby Keita had uh, huge offers from Liverpool, for example, like 75 million euros they wanted to pay. And he's going to go there, but he's going to go there next summer. So they going to have him for one more year and... Um, yeah, they, they managed to keep all their players. Um, so we're all very curious in, in Germany how Leipzig is going to show itself in, in the Champions League. Um, yeah, and then there's uh, Borussia Dortmund as well. They had, um, yeah, they, they changed um, the, the manager as well. Thomas Tuchel is, is gone now after big problems uh, with the club bosses. And now Peter Bosch from the Netherlands is the new guy. And um, yeah, they they have a really really tough group with uh, Tottenham and uh, Real Madrid. So Borussia Dortmund, um, perhaps the the toughest way for them to proceed um, from the first round um, to the uh, to the, uh, uh, the the best of sixteen round. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's uh, so. We're all happy in 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 Germany to have the Bundesliga um, and, and the Champions League start soon. So um, we're gonna we're gonna see what our three clubs are gonna are gonna show there. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly um, exciting stuff. I guess looking at uh, the Bundesliga, Bayern, you did mention earlier they are the dominant uh, side within the competition. When Bayern Munich play their Champions League matches, do fans of the other Bundesliga teams support Bayern Munich? <laughs> That's a good question. And uh, my impression is that uh, they don't so much. I mean, we have 
a lot of football fans in Germany that say, yeah, for example, me, I always say um, I root for the German team, no matter what team, uh, I don't care. I, I want the, the Bundesliga, yeah, to have success. That's that's important for me. And that's what I'm, why I'm rooting for every German team. But um, especially Bayern, um, in Germany, it's like that. Um, you love them or you hate them. That's the thing with Bayern Munich. Um, and so I'd say in general... The fans who are not Bayern fans, um, they're probably not going to cheer for Bayern in the Champions League. Mm, okay. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's interesting. I guess uh, he, he went, we in Australia, we've, we've got uh, uh, teams who qualify through the, um, the A-League, which is our domestic league. They go on and play in the Asian Champions League. And so for, for me, I guess it's from my perspective, I, I just want any of the Australian teams to have success in the Asian Champions League because that means there'll be more um, attention devoted to it. And, and, and yeah, you exactly, feel it. Exactly. That's exact, exactly how I think about it. Um, and um, I think there are a lot of football fans in Germany who also think about it, but yeah, the thing is really um, with Bayern Munich, um, since they are so dominant in the league, um, yeah, the, the 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 fans of other teams kind of get mad at Bayern, and so they don't want to support them. Okay, and and, and speaking to that, uh, with Bayern's dominance, do you think that there are inequalities within the structure of the Bundesliga that enable them to have? advantages in terms of recruiting and maintaining such a highly talented group of players? Yeah, I'd say it's, it's, it's getting um, tougher and tougher and, and, and times change for Bayern. Um, if I look back like 15 years ago, um, when you were a really good player at, um, at a German team, the next step was always to go to Bayern Munich and prove yourself there and, and win championships. Right now, not so much anymore. Um, we see it again and again. I'll take one example. For example, Leroy Sané. Um, he's, uh, he's also a, a German national team player. He played for uh, Schalke 04. And um, um, some years ago, it would still have been uh, typical for him to, to move to Bayern someday. But um, he went straight to Manchester City, to the Premier League. Um, so the step to go to Bayern is not so necessary anymore. Um, there are more and more players who just um, move directly from good German teams uh, directly to the top teams in Premier League or also um, La Primera División in, in, in Spain. Um, and also even uh, players uh, leaving Bayern for other bigger clubs that um, also didn't happen so often some years ago. If I think about uh, Toni Kroos, which is, um, I'd say, the best German middlefield player, Bayern let him go some years ago. And um, he won title after title with uh, Real Madrid just recently. He defended the Champions League title with Real Madrid. So... Bayern is also having some uh, issues uh, with the development of um, the German football that is really going very fast and there's a lot of money involved, uh, especially in England. Okay, so would you say that in terms of sides uh, competing for the Bundesliga title and for teams competing for places in the Champions League through the three spots available automatically for German sides, that the league has become more of a evenly uh, talented uh, number of teams rather than it just be dominated by, say, a select few? Um, I'd say the, 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 if I ever just got you right, I, I'd say that the, the exactly different is, is, is happening. I think, um, the clubs that go to the Champions League are basically the same uh, every year in the last years. It's always been Bayern and Dortmund to the two dominant forces. And after that, yeah, sometimes it's Schalke and Leverkusen and um, all those um, second biggest teams compared uh, to Bayern and Dortmund. But um, the other teams in the last years, they, 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 they lose track a little bit. Um, if I think about smaller teams, I don't know, like um, Freiburg or Augsburg, 
they basically they don't have a real chance of beating Bayern and Dortmund, especially Bayern anymore. Um, it's really really not so often that a team is is really ready to compete with Bayern's extremely high level. Um, and so um, Bayern and Dortmund have grown so far and so fast, um, also because of the money they get from the Champions League, um, that they yeah kind of ran away from the rest of the league. Okay, so even like you were saying before that Bayern aren't necessarily having uh, it all their own way in terms of retaining players and um, having that dominance over their other sides it's still hard for the other competing Bundesliga teams to have the success that they can qualify for the Champions League. Exactly, exactly. So um, Bayern is having, um, yeah, more... It's tough for them to keep up with the big clubs um, like Real Madrid or or, um, the the big English clubs, which are, yeah, they didn't win the Champions League in in the last years, but I think it's going to happen since they have so much money to buy all the players they want. But um, in the Bundesliga, it's exactly how you just um, you just said. Um, Bayern has uh, become so dominant that it's uh, difficult for the the other teams, um, yeah, to keep uh, to keep track of them. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, let's look at the Champions League now. I guess we we touched on the three teams earlier, being uh, Bayern Munich. RB Leipzig and Borussia Dortmund. Looking at their them three sides within their respective groups, what can we expect um, from them in terms of their uh, ability to progress out of the group stage? Yeah, I think it's um, um, the, the chances uh, are really there that all three German teams uh, make it to the to the next stage. I think Bayern is the big favorite to make it. Um, I think they really have the best chances to to advance if I look at their group. Um, I mean, there's Paris Saint-Germain, the the French giant um, who just purchased uh, Neymar and uh, and Mbappé for over 400 million euros. That's really absurd. That's going to be the race for uh, for spot one in this group B, I think. And um, the other teams that are there are Anderlecht and Celtic. Um, I think those two are going to be fighting for um, spot three. So who's going to go to the Europa League? But um, Paris and Bayern are too strong, in my opinion, for Anderlecht and and Celtic. And um, yeah, but Celtic, actually, interesting team. I commentated them in the uh, Champions League playoffs where they uh, advanced. And um, they have really talented and fast players. That could bring some problems to Bayern and Paris. But uh, still, I think they are too strong. Um, So Bayern's going to advance as first or second. And um, Paris, the other way around, uh, and Celtic on the left, uh, they're going to compete for third spot. Um, For Leipzig, um, that's really... A really, really interesting group um, with uh, Monaco from from France, uh, with FC Porto from Portugal, and with uh, Besiktas Istanbul from Turkey. Um, I think that's perhaps the the most even group that there is. Everyone can become first, or everyone can become last. I think. Perhaps Monaco and Leipzig are a little bit stronger since they come from the stronger leagues. Um, I mean, Bundesliga is um, probably the second or third strongest league um, compared to uh, Spain and England. Um, and um, yeah, the French league also lost a bit track. They are they are a little away from the German Bundesliga, I'd say. But Monaco, they played a great campaign last year in in the Champions League. But um, they lost Kylian Mbappé. I think you also uh, heard that in um, in Australia for crazy amount of money, 180 million euros. He's going to Paris. Um, that's really, really absurd. So they are a bit weakened compared to last year. But I think Leipzig and Monaco perhaps a bit the favorites in this um, in this group. But Porto and Besiktas. If they play well, they also have the chance to, to win Group G. So that's that's really a tough one to tell. But I'd say if, if Leipzig plays their football that made them so strong last year, they have a really good chance um, of going to the next stage. 
Yeah, and the last group, um, for me, that's the strongest group all in all. We have uh, Real Madrid, the defending champion, which is the strongest team in Euro Europe for me. Um, they showed that over the last years. They won um, the last four years, three-time champion in the Champions League. That's really crazy. Real Madrid is extremely strong. And um, Dortmund is the second force in this group. And then comes Tottenham, which are, I'd say, not so far away from, from Dortmund. I'm not sure if they are already ready to beat Dortmund in the group stage. I'd say there is a, a slight advantage for Dortmund, but then they have they have to be bring their A game to, to beat Tottenham. And the last uh, participant um, is uh, Apuel from uh, from uh, Zypern, I don't know, how, Cyprus, is that what it's called in, in English? Yeah, I think Cyprus. So. And uh, I think, yeah, they're going to be, they're going to be last spot. Um, they are only, I don't know, collect one, two or three points. Um, but, um, yeah, Real, Dortmund and Tottenham, they're going to play, um, for, for advancing, advancing to the next round. Okay. Yeah. It's certainly, um, a t challenging group for, uh, For, for those teams in uh, the top two from uh, Group H will um done well to get out of that group. Exactly. So looking at the uh, the previous season in Champions League, and, and we had Real Madrid, sorry, um, Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund get through to the quarterfinal stage in very good shape, and, and both of them were expected to progress to the semis there were some um issues with the officiating with um the real madrid <laughs> leg <laughs> um yeah. for Bayern and, and there was the um the terrorist uh incident with uh dortmund's first game against monaco yeah. can you provide your perspective on on those two uh sides with their quarterfinals last year i mean um to start with Bayern, um i think in, in such a game It's really those um, small things that uh, that decide the whole game. I mean, Real and Bayern for a, a quarterfinal, <laughs> that's crazy. It could be the final as well. So um, huge level. The Both teams uh, showed there. Um, everyone was unhappy that they, they met so early in, in this stage already. Yeah, and I think Real Madrid... I mean, they've shown it in the last years. Um, the last four years, they have been the dominant force uh, in European club football. And I think, for one reason, yeah, to start that, that gave them the the strength to always believe um, we can beat everyone, especially at home. Um, and um, Bayern had a little bit, um, yeah, they were not so lucky with the, the referees. Um, They gave a red card uh, to Arturo Vidal. Um, he played a lot of fouls before, but um, especially that one scene where he got the red card, there was not a foul. He, he played the ball. And there were so many things getting together. Um, Arturo Vidal uh, missed a penalty, penalty in, in the first game, the, the home game for Bayern, that would have sent them um, to 2-0, I think. And, um, yeah, that would have been a massive step uh, towards um, the semifinal. But he missed it. That's how football goes. Um, they they conceded two goals um, in their own stadium. That was uh, really tough for Bayern. And uh, they played a really, really strong game uh, in Madrid. Um, they won 2-1 to one there. And then it went to overtime, that game. I mean, not many teams have managed to beat Real 2-1 to one in their own play. So it was really just a match that is decided by very little details. And, um, yeah, those details, um, they just went for Madrid in, in, in that game. And they went on to win the crown for a second consecutive time, the first team that managed to defend the Champions League title. Um, yeah, so that was just a little bit unlucky and a little bit... Um, Just a little things that missed for Bayern in that game. And um, looking at Dortmund, um, um, I still remember being so shocked about what, what happened. Um, the attack on their bus before that game. I mean, you cannot um, ask anyone to play at their full strength uh, just um, 24 hours later. And that's what they had to do. And they lost that home game 2-3. And I don't think you can blame anybody. I think um, I would not have been able to play 
any soccer. I think if that had happened to me, I wouldn't have even been able to to host the game. And um, I cannot imagine how they they even managed to go on the pitch and 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 still play at an okay level. Um, if you take uh, what what happened just hours before, and um, Mark Batra was um, severely injured, and and uh, I don't know, didn't miss much. Um, people could have died there. It was so horrible. And I think um, you can't blame Dortmund there. Monaco just uh, did their thing, what made them strong all year, what brought them to the semifinals. Um, yeah, and I don't think you can blame Dortmund. And um, I just hope um, they they recovered completely from all that um, and they're going to have a strong campaign uh, this year in the Champions League. It's great to um, hear your take on on both of their um, their quarterfinals. And, and certainly in the case of Dortmund, yeah, it, it, it's pretty remarkable. They managed to to to, to play in, in the manner they did just 24 hours after experiencing what they did on the bus. Yeah, yeah so um, looking at the newcomer to Champions League football, RB Leipzig, uh, Red Bull Leipzig, yeah. what can you say about them in the, their story, the fact that they had their first season in the Bundesliga last year and they managed to come second and are now playing Champions League football this year? Yeah, I mean, uh, if you look look only at the sports side, um, it's just amazing the work they did in in Leipzig over the last years. Um, I don't know how many. I think about ten years ago, um, Red Bull, the company, decided decided um, yeah to to have to, they wanted to have a, a club in 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 Germany that represents them in Germany. They uh, had Red Bull Salzburg um, in in Austria, where where Red Bull comes from for a long time, but they were not successful. Um, they failed to qualify for the Champions League uh, ten times in a row. Now they always lost in the Champions League playoffs. That's really crazy. What happened to Red Bull Salzburg there? And now we got, um, they are not called Red Bull Leipzig, but Rasenballsport Leipzig, but everyone uh, knows what is meant by RB Leipzig uh, in Germany. And um, yeah, sports-wise, um, they really had a remarkable um, development over the year, last years. Um, they've managed um, to, to go, um, I think they started in the fifth league if I'm not wrong and they, they um yeah they managed to come up really fast and then their their first Bundesliga com um season that was uh, that was just insane. I mean um if anyone had told me they are gonna finish um one spot um before Borussia Dortmund I'd uh, have said hey come on can't be serious about that. Um, I know they are not a, a normal new team in the Bundesliga since they have the Red Bull money. But still, um, I mean, you have to play those games. You have to win those games. And um, also the fashion they played. They played just great football. Um, so fast, so intense, um, so offensively strong-minded. And yeah, that was really great to watch. And um if they can transfer any of that into the Champions League uh, group stage, I think um, they have good chances uh, to advance. Yeah, well, well, it'll certainly be exciting to watch how they go in the Champions League. You did mention earlier that uh, in the Bundesliga, it's basically a case of um, the powerhouses like Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund staying at the top and for the other sides within the comp, finding it difficult to find that success. What, what is it about RB Leipzig that they've managed to be um, different to that trend and they've managed to emerge in such a short space of time to become a Champions League team? Um, I'd say <laughs> I think we could do a whole whole podcast just about that. It's really an interesting topic. I mean, first of all, I don't want to talk about that too much, but... Um, I have to mention they, they have the Red Bull money. That's the base uh, for everything. But uh, for me, there's there's two yeah really genius guys that do the work there. That's um, uh, Ralf Rangnick, um, who is the manager. And um, when he was still 
uh, a trainer. He he did the same thing with uh, Hoffenheim uh, uh, around uh, 10 years ago. They came up to the Bundesliga and uh, they also, in, in their first half series, they they gave Bayern Munich um, yeah, a, a tough fight for the top spot. Um, in the end, they, they couldn't hold on uh, and didn't finish the season so strong, uh, Hoffenheim. But uh, Leipzig kind of reminded me of that. And Leipzig, they managed um, yeah, to, to play a full first season on a really high level in the Bundesliga. And um, yeah, I think uh, Ralf Rangnick, the manager, he, he set the basis for this. And the other one is the trainer, is um, Ralf Hasenhüttl. Um, which um, he, he worked before at other German clubs also very successfully. And um, yeah, they brought him to Leipzig and that was uh, exactly the right choice, a really golden choice. Um, he had an understanding of football that um, just matched perfectly with the players um, he had there in, in Leipzig. Um, fast players like um, Timo Werner, the, the German national team striker, um, two genius players in, in midfield with uh, Nabi Keita uh, and Emil Forsberg. And um, yeah, I'd go, I could go on forever and ever. They, they just found a way to really play um, very fast. And uh, I think they caught many of the clubs by surprise last year. I think they're going to have a, a harder time in their second le um, season in the Bundesliga right now. But uh, for their first season... They just did uh, everything right, and that's uh, mainly because of uh, Ralf Rangnick, the manager, and Ralf Hasenhüttl, the trainer of RB Leipzig. Okay, yeah, well, yeah, that, that, that's great to uh, to know. Uh, so, all right, let's look ahead uh, now in terms of what your expectations are beyond uh, the group stage. I know you did mention earlier that you're expecting all three sides, really, to get through the the first stage uh, the, for the group stage and you did say the uh, the hardest team probably is going to find it maybe Borussia given they've got Tottenham and Real uh, Madrid in their group what yeah. are your expectations uh, for the whole tournament for the three German sides yeah <laughs> that's that's always a, a tough one um, for me I think um, if Leipzig is going to advance um, to the next round um I mean, basically, it completely depends on what uh, matchup they're going to get then. But I think, um, yeah, in the round of 16, there are so many good teams that I think Leipzig in their first year in the Champions League would be really a huge surprise for me if they at once uh, advance to the to the quarterfinals. Um, I'd say if they manage to go to the group stage, the next stage would be the end for them, but that would be a great uh, accomplishment uh, to finish, um, to go to the group stage um, for in, in their first season in the Champions League. Um, Dortmund, I think, is ready to go to the quarterfinals again. Semifinals, I think that's going to be a tough one. Um, they'd need... Yeah, a, a, a little luck uh, concerning what, what teams they're going to have to play. Um, I mean, Dortmund, um, they're in a group with Real Madrid. So if they are unlucky, for example, they get in the round of 16, they, they already get um, Barcelona, who finished first in their, in their group, for example, just an example. But that can happen easily. And I think then... Yeah, for Dortmund, even um, that round would be the end. So I think for Dortmund, yeah, round of 16 or the quarterfinal would be the end. Um, anything above that, if Dortmund goes to the semifinal, um, would be the first time since they reached the final in uh, 2013, which they lost against Bayern. That would be just a huge accomplishment, um, especially since they lost um, Dembele, for example, their key players. So I think, yeah, it's going to be mm, perhaps quarterfinal for Dortmund or the round of 16. And for Bayern, um, you have to say they basically have to go, as absurd as it sounds, but um, they have to go minimum to the semifinal. Otherwise, um, there will be a lot of critique on, on Carlo Ancelotti. I mean, if we think back to the Pep Guardiola um, time, 
they went uh, to the to the semifinals every single year with uh, Pep Guardiola. And um, if we think uh, one time ahead um, with your pine kiss, they went to the final one year, lost it against Chelsea. Next year, they came back even stronger and won the whole thing against Dortmund in the final. Yeah, and... Um, Last year, it was the first time that uh, for a long, long time, since uh, 2011, Bayern didn't advance to the semifinals. So in Munich, yeah, the fans are really kind of used to going to the Champions League final. The bar has been set so high by really awesome work that um, also Louis van Gaal and later Jupp Heynckes and Pep Guardiola have done. So I think Ancelotti... He has to bring Bayern to the semifinals, no matter which club comes. Um, I mean, Bayern, they could also, um, I don't know, meet a club like Juventus or Manchester United in the first KO stage. That could happen, but there will be no excuses. Bayern has to go to the semifinal. Everything else, um, yeah, would, um, would disappoint the fans in, in Munich. I think, um, since Bayern has been so successful those last years. But I also have to say, everything above semifinal, you cannot um, plan or you cannot say um, we have to reach the final. I mean, that's always a goal, but um, you can't do that on a regular basis, except you are Real Madrid. They, I don't know how they do it. They team seem to do it every year. But I think semifinal, that would be good for Bayern. Uh, final would be super, and of course the title, that's what everyone wants, but um, you cannot plan that. But I also think the pressure is high in Munich. They have to reach the semi-final, in my view. Mm, yeah, yeah. Now, that, that's interesting. You know, it's certainly uh, given you all the the, the recent hist- historical success with the Champions League um, for buy-in and, and the fact that, yeah, if they don't make the semi-finals two years in a row, it would um, be quite a quite a big deal. Exactly, exactly. That's the thing. The bar is set so high in Munich that you cannot afford to to not reach the Champions League semi final. Um, to not reach it two years in a row. Mm, yeah, well, yeah, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Well, let's um assume Bayern make the semi finals. Uh, in terms of the other European clubs that are participating in the uh, Champions League. Who would you say would be the three favourite teams to uh, progress to the semi-finals at this stage um, uh, in time? Ooh, I only have one definite uh, favourite. That's Real Madrid. They impressed me so much over those last years. Um, they they also they kept their core. I mean, they sold uh, Alvaro Morata. Um, to England, but um, that was not a key player. They kept Ronaldo, they kept Bale, Toni Kroos. Um, they have all their great players, and they are, yeah, they are still not not so old that you'd say, okay, they would have, uh, they'll have some problems this year. So Real Madrid is still the European powerhouse for me. Um, perhaps what could um, stop them a little bit. Um, even though no one uh, will uh, will admit that. I think if you won the title three out of four times over the last years, perhaps this, this last hunger that gives you the last step towards 100%, perhaps um, you lose that a little bit. Um, we've seen that again and again. In the last years, it's it's often been like that, that um, um, teams who, who, who suffered really hard losses um, – they they managed to come back stronger. It was the thing with Bayern, who lost their final at their home stadium in Munich and won the whole thing last year. Um, in the in this year, when Bayern won, um, they dominated uh, Barcelona and won in the semi final by um, four zero and three zero. And what happened after Barcelona got um, yeah they were really. Everyone was devastated in Barcelona what Bayern did to them. They came back stronger and won the thing in uh, 2014. So that happened again and again and again. And I think this little push that you sometimes need when you didn't win the title, that's perhaps the one thing that Real Madrid's going to miss. But still, um, they have so much talent. Uh, they are such a force. They are a big favorite for me. Yeah, and the other ones, whew, that's that's really a toughie. Um, I'd say 
Bayern has the pressure. They are also among the favorites. Barcelona has it as well. But Barcelona doesn't seem to have this um, this power and um, their confidence and also yeah what what made them so strong last uh, the last years um, they seem to have lost a little bit track in in Spain against Real Madrid so perhaps Barcelona is for me only yeah like number four or five this year and now I have to pick one favorite from England that's really a toughie so we have as the big favorites you asked for three for me it's Real Bayern and yeah that's really tough who's the one I'm gonna pick one from the Premier League and I'm gonna say it's Manchester City since um I think Pep Guardiola is a huge genius and he also has the pressure he has to win titles this year These years, um, perhaps already this year, he won't have much time um, in in uh, Manchester if he doesn't uh, bring it this year. So I think these are my three favorites: Real, Bayern, and Manchester City. Okay, yeah, that, that's great. Now, uh, uh, and how about one more just to make it a, a final four? Yeah, um, hmm, I'm a, I'm go, am I gonna stick with Barcelona? Perhaps I'll stick with Barcelona, even though it's kind of boring to always have those uh, big, uh, the two giants from from Spain. But I'd say Barcelona is is the fourth team. Okay, all right. Now well, let's see how, how it all unfolds. And just before we go, a couple of quick questions. Uh, we've also got our Willy Orban, the skipper of RB Leipzig, on the show today. Uh, what can you tell our listeners about Willy in terms of um, his career progress and, and uh, his uh, impact on the RB Leipzig side? Yeah, I mean, I mean he was uh, definitely a, a big part of, of uh, what Leipzig uh, did last year. Um, um, Huge. Nah, he's he's not even a talent, but I'd still hey he's he's still so young. He's only 24 years old, so he's kind of the perfect mixture of of a talent, but also a player who showed it last year already how good he is. I mean, he's uh, he's the captain of uh, RB Leipzig. He's he's proven himself to really be a strong force uh, last year as a centre back in in the Bundesliga. Um, and I think he, he brings a lot to the game. He's, he's not the biggest guy. Um, he's not the tallest guy for a, for a center back, but, um, he moves very well. He anticipates very well. Um, yeah, he's, he's just a clever player. So, uh, he, yeah, really a complete center back, I'd say. Fantastic. Yeah. You mentioned earlier when we first started talking that, that you've, you've got an NFL commentary. And the NFL season's just kicked off. Can you give us um, your um, teams to watch in terms of uh, who may progress to the Super Bowl come the business end of the season? Yeah, for me in the in the AFC, um, I've thought about the Patriots, but um, they lost just this night, so I'm not so sure anymore. And for me, even the bigger threats, perhaps even the biggest threat in the AFC is the Oakland Raiders. Um, if quarterback Derek Carr really bounced back from his injury that, um, yeah, got him in the worst moment last year, I think they would have been already ready to make a big playoff run last year. But I think um, it's time for the Oakland Raiders um, to do it uh, this year and perhaps as a goodbye gift to the great city of Oakland that they're going to leave for, for Las Vegas in the next years. So I think in the AC. I'd say the Raiders. Uh, I don't know if I if I, I also kind of want that. I just um, it it was so devastating for me to watch uh, Derek Carr go out in the worst moment and to not be able to play the playoffs. Um, I'd I'd wish him to make a great run in the in the regular season this year again and then also make a great run, perhaps even to the Super Bowl um, in in this season. And yeah, in the NFC, it's always it's so tough. Every year, I think the AC is uh, more difficult to call than, uh, uh, sorry, the NFC is more difficult to call than the AFC. Um, who? I'd say the Atlanta Falcons, since they lost Shanahan, their offensive coordinator, genius, uh, he went to San Francisco. I don't think they can reproduce, reproduce what they did um, last year. That was really outstanding. 
But I think their defense is going to be better this year since they have a bunch of young players. Um, and I think um, they learned a lot from this uh, amazing season and the tough, tough loss in the Super Bowl. Also, these tough losses, they can make you uh, great players um, if you find the right way yeah, to, to keep them in, in your mind and learn from them. So I think the Falcons are going to be strong, but I don't think they're going to make it to the Super Bowl this year since they lost Shanahan. I think that's really a key part. Yeah, who's going to make it? Um, perhaps it's the Seattle Seahawks again or the Green Bay Packers. That's the two teams I always mention. Um, yeah, I think Packers or Seahawks. I think it's it's time for one of them to, to make it again this year. Aaron Rodgers is such a genius. He can win you any game. And the Seattle defense, holy moly. I think they're ready to, to get back their crown of being number one defense this year. Last year was the Patriots. I think the, the Seahawks are ready to get that back. And defense wins championships, as we say. So... Packers or Seahawks, that's my big favorite. And I also have kind of a secret favorite in the NFC. And um, for me, that's the Carolina Panthers. I mean, okay. they went to the Super Bowl two years ago. Then they had a horrible season last year, starting with this crazy game. They lost to Denver in their, in their season opener. But I think they are going to bounce back. And I think Cam Newton, he still has his mojo He's going to bounce back strongly this year. I don't know if he's going to bounce back that strongly that he's going to bring them to the Super Bowl, but watch the Panthers. Okay, yeah, well, certainly um, they were dominant uh, two seasons ago where they were favorites to win the Super Bowl. Exactly. And how about the Dallas Cowboys? Uh, what do you rate their chances? Actually, I've thought about it very much, but I think the Cowboys, I think they're going to make it to the playoffs. But um, the NFC East is so damn strong, the division they play in. I think um, the Giants are going to be uh, strong this year. Um, I'm very excited to see uh, what the Eagles are going to be able in the second year of Carson Wentz. Um, and also the Redskins. I mean, they, they played uh, really well those those last years. They have such such a strong division, the NFC East. And um, I think um, last year, the Cowboys, they, they kind of rode on a, on a wave. You know, they had a good start to the season and everyone was saying, hey, man, what's up with Ezekiel Elliott and Dak Prescott? And they played so well. It was just amazing. And they still have those two threats and they have probably still the best offensive line in the league. But I think... Now everyone knows what to expect from the Cowboys. Everyone is looking at the Cowboys. And for me, their defense is not the strongest. They have uh, problems, um, also disciplinary problems, especially in the defense every year. And I think that's going to set them back a little bit. I think they are still good to go 10-6 or maybe 11-5. And that would secure a playoff spot in the NFC East. But I don't think the Cowboys are going to make um, a run to the Super Bowl. Yeah, no, that's an interesting uh, take, and and yeah, we'll we'll um we'll see uh, how how it all unfolds. Uh, we certainly uh once again appreciate your time. And before we go, can you tell our listeners uh what's the best way to keep in touch with um all your activity, Florian? Ah, uh, there actually there's there's two ways. Um, you can follow me on Twitter if you want to. Um, my nickname is at Schmizo. Um. I don't know. Can I? Uh, I'm so bad at, at, at spelling in in in, in English. Um, it's uh, S C H M I S O. So Schmizo. Yeah, just just try to find that. No worries. And um, that's on Twitter. And uh, also have a Facebook page if you're interested in that. That's um, my my whole name, Florian Schmidt Sommerfeld. You can just um, Google that, and um, then you should find my my Facebook page. Fantastic, yeah. I'm sure our listeners uh, will um, add them, add you to um, their Twitter and Facebook pages, and 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 yeah, keep informed with uh, with all your um, goings on, and and certainly uh, learn more about um, all the things you do, and and follow uh, you with respect to uh not only football but uh nfl and handball so um that's 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 terrific uh and yeah so all the best with um with the season ahead uh 
uh, for all the sports and we certainly look forward to uh, hearing you behind the mic on, on the commentary. Yeah, thank you so much, three, and uh, yeah, I hope you have a you're gonna have a good time with your with your with your podcast, not only with this episode, but uh, everything that is going on uh, as well. I'll be definitely a, a new listener from from now on. Uh, yeah, and uh, all the best to you as well, and uh, thanks for having me. No worries, thanks, Misa. I really appreciate the time, and we look forward to uh, speaking to you soon. Thank you so much. I'll be happy to be back. A very interesting chat with Florian. Nice to get his take on the NFL too. Maybe a multi on buy-in into the Oakland Raiders is worth a look. Now to our bonus interview. We were lucky to get a few words with the captain of RB Leipzig, Willy Orban, and here he is providing his thoughts on his side's Champions League campaign. Willy, thanks for joining us. After such a successful Bundesliga in 2016-17, how are the team feeling about playing Champions League football this season? We are all very excited to be part of the Champions League this season. For most of us, it will be the first time on the biggest European stage in football. I think all players, staff and fans in Leipzig will have goosebumps when the Champions League theme plays for the first time on Wednesday. How do you view your three opponents in Group G? Monaco, Porto and Besiktas. They are all very good teams. Monaco had a great last season, making it to the semi-final of the Champions League. Porto already won it twice and they have so much experience on that level already. And what I have heard, to play at Besiktas with their loud fans will be one of the most difficult away games in Europe. So we know that we have to play our best to be successful. And what expectations have you set as a team in terms of progress within the Champions League this season? Like last season, when we were new to the Bundesliga, we are new in the Champions League now. Maybe we can surprise again, but first of all we want to enjoy the games and the atmosphere. We are a very young team and we need to learn quickly to be able to compete with the other teams. But I have faith in our squad to do so. We are hungry and we want to show our attractive and offensive football also in the Champions League. Nice to hear from Willy. We wish him and RB Leipzig all the best in their maiden Champions League campaign. And it'll be interesting to see how they fare in Group G, which looks to be quite an open field. Now to our next guest, Grant Vink of the Imperial Hotel. Our show is the Sports Bar Life, and here in Australia, UEFA Champions League means early morning TV. You are going to struggle to watch Champions League after work, without someone spoiling the result for you. For anyone in Melbourne who wants to experience their Champions League side take to the field and watch them live on TV, Grant is here to tell you exactly what kind of experience you'll get at the Imperial. Thanks for joining us, Grant. It's great to have you on the show. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so um, so can you give our listeners a bit of an, uh, a bit of a introduction about the imperial where you are located and your opening hours yeah of course um so yeah we're at um two to eight burke street pretty much on the corner of spring and burke street opposite the uh parliament train station and um state parliament there um in the melbourne cbd um we're lucky enough to have a late night license so bar a few little minor exceptions we're able to open um more or less whenever there's a game on um that we think people might be coming in for we don't don't stay open you know, in those hours if there's nothing on. But, you know, if there's, there's predominantly football, obviously, um, for us. But, um, yeah, whenever there's a game on, pretty much able to open up for it. So, yeah, it's pretty lucky for us. Yeah, that's really good. So, in terms of uh, football, so you guys will be showing the Champions League this week? Yeah, of course. Um, so, we open up um, essentially for every um, Champions League match day. Um particularly the ones where we've got, you know, some of our supporters clubs that um, kind of call themselves, call this home for them. Um, so, yeah, we've got, this year we're lucky enough to have Liverpool, City, Tottenham and Barcelona who are all, and Bayern Munich actually, who are all regulars in the Champions League and all in there um, this year, call us home. So, can get pretty decent crowds in with those supporters clubs. So, yeah. Yeah, that's that's really good because um, I guess... Given the hours, um, the 
matches are broadcast for Australia and Melbourne in particular. Uh, it is it is quite early morning, so um, to get uh, patronage to uh, the Imperial must be pretty um, good for you guys as well. Yeah, exactly. It's um, it's it's pretty good. We're, I think Australians get behind a lot of different sports and that. So having those organised supporters clubs that um, that you know they support themselves kind of thing and it's big for them to have a venue that you know they know that if it's on then we'll have it on um you know the manchester city blues the um liverpool supporters club tottenham guys they all turn out and in really good numbers um particularly you know champions league games big big for them when they're in there yeah yeah for sure so in terms of this week which are the games that you'll be showing um so yeah on wednesday obviously we're we're limited by what bn sports the official broadcaster um decide to show um so i think for the wednesday morning games it is we've got uh barca juve chelsea quarabag i believe that's <laughs> they're called yeah um manchester united and basil um, and then the big day for us is obviously going to be the Thursday with, with the clubs, like I mentioned, um, that we have in here regularly. Um, we've got three of those guys all playing um, at the same time. At, I think it's 4.45 kickoff in the morning. So we've got Liverpool, Sevilla, Feyenoord um, versus Melbourne, uh, Manchester City, uh, Tottenham and Dort- Dortmund, I believe they're playing. So, um, And for myself as an Ajax fan, I'm hoping that the uh, City boys get up over Feyenoord. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. And so, so you're you're showing three games on each day. How many screens do you have to show all the matches? Yeah, so we have um, we predominantly for the Champions League stuff. We uh, just open up on our ground floor level, which is our main sports bar area. Which down there we have um, one big HD projector screen, and then we have eight large plasma screens as well, uh, which we have the area kind of divided up into three different zones, so we're able to then show um, show the games with commentary in those three different areas. So, um, yeah, it's, it's quite handy because obviously it's a big thing to get the atmosphere going for those supporters that come out for it, um, you know, to have the commentary on and all well, that. It's not like, you know, a lot of other sports bar where you'll just be chucked in a, in a corner if they're going to put it on for you. So we kind of pride ourselves on that. Yeah, for sure. That, that's that's really good. I'm sure they they appreciate that. In terms of... Um... Crowds. What sort of crowds do you get uh, at the Imperial at, at that hour? Um, yeah, well, we like to load it up with as many different, you know, people that are interested in the game as possible. But um, obviously, we've got our local, you know, the diehards that are in those supporters clubs um, that rock up for every game, every week, no matter what what time, um, and they're kind of the core of it. But then, you know, outside of that, we we get a lot of, you know, your expats and um, backpackers that are living in the city as well will come out for it, particularly the Spanish. Um, backpackers, we seem to see a lot of them for the uh, Barca and Real games coming through, and then you'll get office wo- workers kind of just wander in as well and have a look, something to something to do before they uh, get to work. Yeah, for sure, that's that's really handy. So, in um, given that the games are, as you mentioned, at four forty-five in the morning, do you serve food at this hour? Um, so, for for us on the the really big games where we know we're going to have quite a large large crowd um, rock up, so particularly some of the Liverpool games later on towards, you know, maybe not so much earlier in the season, but um, later on as it's getting, you know, to the nitty-gritty sort of stuff, um, we'll open up the kitchen then and just, um, yeah, we just dump out kind of, you know, your bacon and egg rolls and whatnot um, early in the morning, but for early on in the season, um, there's there's no kitchen open at that point, but we do have all your usual kind of bar snacks and, and whatnot to keep you going. Yeah, that's handy. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and in relation to this week, uh, you mentioned uh, some of the big uh, clubs related who have in Melbourne have their supporter groups. What sort of numbers do you think will, will come in uh, on on either day, but in particular Thursday? Um, so for the for the Thursday, obviously it can be variable with that early in the morning, but particularly the Liverpool fans, being such a massive club, um, they tend to turn out in big numbers. So you know, we'd we'd hope for probably. You know, maybe 60 or so Liverpool fans, and then you'll get, you know, the the city guys, the, the real diehards. We see the same group of guys are being guaranteed pretty much every week. So, you know, 20 or 30 of those. Um, and then Tottenham as well, um, about about the same. So, you know, we hope, obviously, as many as possible um, getting some more that are in, the better the atmosphere. But, um, you know, all that we'll probably be hoping for at least 100-plus people in the venue at that time. 
Wow, that, that's that's pretty amazing. Given it's so early in the morning. Yeah, that's that's wait. So we've got there's some pretty uh, passionate supporters out there, and just having those supporters club based at the pub really helps because they can kind of call it a home. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, that's good. And in relation to the rest of the football calendar, what uh, other football do you broadcast at the Imperial? So, yeah, like I say, our saying here is if it's on, it's on. Um, so if there's any game on of, of football that you're interested in coming and seeing, um, you know, contact the venue and we'll generally be able to put it on. Um, obviously, our big one is the Premier League. Those clubs um, turn out in the biggest numbers and we stay open for all, all those clubs that um, I mentioned each time. We've also got Southampton and some Brighton fans that come in regularly, obviously uninvolved in Champions League. Um, and outside of that, we've got a good community of Chilean and Colombian fans that come in for their World Cup qualifiers and the La Liga games, you know, the, some of the bigger La Liga games. There seems to be a lot of Spanish in the um, Melbourne CBD um, that are coming up for that. And we've also had a close working relationship with uh, Melbourne City and also when it was Melbourne Heart before the takeover. Um, so their fans generally come in on match days. So I think on Thursday afternoon or Wednesday afternoon it is, we'll have the uh, FFA Cup game on against Sydney. Um, which we're hoping to draw a decent crowd for as well, obviously with the link between Manchester as well. Um, they kind of cross over those those crowds. So that's generally the main ones that rock up. But like I said, we'll we'll put anything that's on if people are interested in it. Nice. Yeah, that's really good. And so Bundesliga as well, you can show games if someone asks if they came in? Yeah, so Bundesliga is um, on BN Sports. So we're able to show that. Um, we do have the Melbourne Bayern Munich Supporters Club as well um call us home like when you come into the venue you'll see all of our you know it's got the frame shirts up of all our different supporters club um and they they're pretty good as well they uh when they rock up they turn up in good numbers yeah oh that's that's great yeah it's good good to know i guess for any fans who aren't really aware of the supporter groups and and the fact you you, you can show pretty much any live uh football so in regards to keeping up to date with the Imperial and um, any events or uh, that you might be showing. What's the best way for listeners to keep in touch with you guys? Yeah, so the best best way, is particularly for the sports and um, for football in particular, um, is to check out our website, which is Um That we have a, a live um, sports calendar on there that you can see everything that we will show. But even if there's something not on there, it might just be something a bit more obscure. If it's being televised, just give us a call um, to the venue and we'll tell you if we can do it, um, which we'll always endeavour to do if we can. Um, which, yeah, if people are trying to contact us, our phone number is 9810 0062. Um, and then obviously we're on all of the different social medias, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, all of that. So, yeah, following us on there is a good way to keep up to date with what's going on. And, and Grant, uh, outside of football, what other sports do you show at the Imperial? Um, yes, obviously we kind of pride ourselves on, on the football, but, um, yeah, we, we're a sports bar at heart um, generally. So any sport that's on, like we said, if it's on, it's on. Um, but, yeah, obviously coming into September, it's huge for the uh, AFL in particular in Melbourne being in the uh, CBD stone throw from MCG and Eddie had. Um, which you know we're pretty excited. We've just put on put in a um, big jumbotron screen on the rooftop that we've named Gumby. Um, mm-hmm. So we'll be showing all of the AFL finals up there. We also had the uh, Manchester City Liverpool game up there on the weekend. It was just it was great great atmosphere up there. So um, something we're pretty excited about. Something pretty new, I think, to the uh, Melbourne CBD. Yeah, for sure. Well, that, that, that's fantastic. Uh, I'm sure um, you're going to be getting a lot more patronage. Well, I'm sure you already get a lot, but you're going to be getting a lot of fans just to come in to see the Jumbotron on the rooftop bar. Yeah, no, it's, um, that's what we're hoping. You know, it's just yeah, something pretty unique and uh, we'll think it'll get some people up onto the rooftop there that otherwise might have just stayed on ground floor um, watching the game. So, um yeah, no, it's fantastic, and you know, you can bring bring the girlfriend along and have some espresso martinis up there and whatnot. <laughs> so, um, it's just yeah, it's good atmosphere for everyone, I think. All right, fantastic. Well, yeah, that that's great uh, insight you've given us, Grant, and we certainly appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, we we can't wait for the Champions League to kick off, and 
and our listeners uh, are now aware, if they weren't already, uh, that the Imperial will be showing live Champions League three games each day this week and uh, with quite high numbers to come in at such an early hour in the day. Yeah, no problem. Well, it's, um, we look forward to seeing some people in. We're also happy um, if anyone mentions the podcast when they come in um, on either of those days. We'll uh, give them a nice little discount on some drinks or coffees or whatever they're after. So Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Oh Well, uh, yeah, that's it's good to um, have spoke to you today, Grant, and get your insight and, and learn more about the Imperial. And I'm sure our listeners will uh, look forward to coming down to check out all the, all the Champions League and and football and other sports that you broadcast at the Imperial. No worries, yeah. Well, like I said, thanks for having us on, and uh, we look forward to seeing all your listeners into in the venue. Lots learnt chatting to Grant, and the Imperial is certainly a destination for any Champions League fan. It's also good to chat to him at the beginning of the Champions League too, so you can keep them in mind as the tournament progresses as well. Also... When you go to the Imperial, make sure you mention Sports Bar Life at the bar and you'll be able to take advantage of a nice discount. So that's our Champions League preview show. Thank you for listening and thank you to all our guests today. Make sure you follow all our guests on their social media channels if you haven't already and subscribe to the show on the platform you are listening to and to us on Twitter. The Twitter handles are provided in the show's description. Looking forward to a great season in Champions League football. Thank you once again. Till next time.